Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I'll be reading for us, beginning with verse 15. The words are in the bulletin, they'll also be on the screens in front of you. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You that You have spoken and not uh, remained hidden. Lord, we don't have to wonder at what our purpose is, what we're doing here in this universe. Lord, what, uh, what our value is. We don't need to wonder at our identity. Father, You have made so clear all that is needful for us to live our life and to live it well. And Father, we pray that You would help us to overcome, Lord, some of our own resistance to being told, to being told who we are, what we are, what we should do. And Lord, instead, help us to humbly receive the Word of our Creator and our Redeemer, the Word of our God. And so bless the reading of Your Word. And Lord, in the preaching that follows, we pray that in as much as it is faithful to Your message, that it would be helpful to each one of us. If not, let it be quickly forgotten. We pray these blessings on the reading and the preaching of Your Word in Christ's name. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning with verse 15, the Word of God. In my vain life I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand, for the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I have tested by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turned my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom in the scheme of things, and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things, which my soul sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I have found that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. This ends the reading of God's Word. Well, that is a difficult text. I can remember in one of my early courses on preaching, they call it homiletics in seminary, I was told that whenever you deal with a text, one of the things you have to do is deal with the difficulties. Because if you don't deal with the difficulties, people will be so distracted by them that they won't understand a word you say. So I want to address two difficulties right out the gate. Number one, do not be overly wicked. That is not an invitation to be kind of wicked. <laughs> that is not an invitation to say, well, I'll only sin a little bit then. More on that in a moment. Number two, one man in a thousand I have found, but not a single woman. Do not think, men, that this means that you are one-tenth of one percent superior to women. <laughs> this is a text which could on the one hand be a biographical statement of Solomon, saying Solomon in his desperation to find sense and meaning in the world was looking for clearly someone upright, that's the context, and he found no women that could deal straight with him and be upright, straightforward, candid, act with integrity, and if in fact it is biographical, 
and Solomon raised that complaint to me, I would say, what would you expect sleeping with a thousand women? How is any one of them going to take you seriously and give you a fair shake? You're a hound dog. But on the other hand, I don't want to back off and ignore the fact that there is this Hebrew phrase, one in a thousand. That occurs in two other places in all of Old Testament literature. One in Job chapter 33 where Job says, if only I had a mediator, one in a thousand. The other place it occurs is in the Song of Songs, when the lover is described as fairest of ten thousand, one in ten thousand. And that image, in both of those other cases, is clearly applied by preachers from the time of Augustine straight through to the great preachers of today in both Job and in Song of Songs as a reference to Jesus Christ, fairest Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And this is also, I believe, a reference to the Messiah. Then in all of humanity, there's one upright person that could be found. And to support this, I want you to consider just earlier a couple verses Solomon says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. That includes every one of the thousand he identified. But not that one. I'm a preacher of the Gospel, and I deal as carefully and faithfully with texts as I can with the goal of helping the Scriptures lead us to Christ. All of these Scriptures are about Christ. Those two difficulties out of the way. Women, you are in no way inferior to men. Dear Christian, you are in no way given a license to dabble in sin. Okay, have those been laid to rest? Yes. Back to the text and the sermon begins now if you're keeping track of time. This sermon begins with a very somber observation. And the observation is simply this. In my vain life, I have seen everything. You know, I've seen it all. And I've seen a man who perishes in his righteousness and a wicked man who preserves his life in evil doing. One of the fixtures in ancient, and especially in ancient Israelite theology, philosophy, ethics, is this idea that good men prosper, evil men come to bad. And Solomon here is saying, in my whole life, in all of that time that I spent pursuing pleasure and pain and building projects, in all of my vain life, I saw it all and I noticed that there is not a rule that governs everything in a manner that I can predictably say, if I live this way, I will therefore prosper in these ways. And notice, if you were here last week, that that builds exactly on what he's just been writing about. That God does not let us have only good days. He gives us good days in which we can rejoice, verse 14 of chapter 7 says, and He gives us days of adversity so that we don't know what will happen next. God wants us to have a degree of uncertainty in our life because that uncertainty is what enables us to live by faith. If you knew exactly what was going to happen tomorrow and the next day and the next day, faith would be of no practical function in your life. We're called to live by faith precisely because we cannot live otherwise. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what the doctor is going to say at our next visit. We don't know what the market is going to do to our 401k after the next election cycle. We don't know what other nations are going to get sucked into the Ukraine war. And so we have to live by faith. There's uncertainty. And that uncertainty even touches the question of our, our very lives. And so there is a long kind of, think of it as a stream of consciousness here that ties this whole section of Scripture that I've read together. 
there's this problem of the fact that good men die young, bad men live forever. Obviously a bit of a caricature, but that's the idea here. And the advice he gives, the advice Solomon gives in light of his long life, his story wisdom, his aha moment that had come later in life, is that there are a couple of essential truths you must hold on to dearly in the light of all of this. One, surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Two, wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. That's verses 19 and 20. I'm going to go back to the verses that came right before that in a moment. These are, in a sense, the proof in the pudding. Wisdom is more important than power. One wise man is given preference in verse 19 over ten rulers who are in a city. The strongest men in the ancient world exercise their strength in cities. One person who has wisdom has more strength than ten rulers. And I want you to think about how rarely we, we take that to heart. We live in a world where increasingly power is everything. If you have enough power, you can force through the most ridiculous, crazy notions you could ever want to. If you have enough power, you can cause science itself to stand on its head. I read an interview a couple of months back of a, it was one of these things that was on, the, on YouTube. And it was a, a woman being interviewed, so I watched it, didn't read it, where she was a Russian scientist who came over to America after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And she was talking about how ideologies can become power structures that force wisdom into false channels. And this is what she was talking about. She was an agriculturalist. And she said ideology required them to believe that Siberia could be turned into a breadbasket, much like Ukraine is. And they believed that if they tried hard enough and worked hard enough, they could create a crop that could grow in Siberia. And despite the fact that all of the science said, no, it's not going to happen, the powers that be forced it through. So how many people labored with hoes and tractors and planters and harvesters in the steppes of Siberia, not because of wisdom, but because of ten rulers in a city. And you and I might think, goodness gracious, to try to grow a grain crop in the tundra? That's dumber than anything. But if the right people are in power, you'll find yourself doing it. We don't have to look far in our own country to see how power trumps wisdom. Many, many years ago, Mr. Rogers warned could the culture in very poignant statements he made on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood that boys are boys and girls are girls and it will always be that way. He saw what was coming. And now, power would require you to acknowledge that the wisdom so clearly manifest, God's wisdom so clearly demonstrated in the created order, is irrelevant. And power would dictate to you the terms of your life. How does this tie into the fact that good men die young, bad men live forever? Extremes are to be avoided. Extremes are to be avoided. And the extremes that Solomon identifies are being overly righteous and overly wise. That's one extreme. And the other is to be overly wicked. And this is what that means. Let's start with overly wicked. That doesn't mean be a little bit wicked and be a little bit wise. That means do not conceive of yourself as having the opportunity to pursue all wickedness. This is a, and we don't all have the benefit of going to seminary, and that's probably a good thing, but there's some things in seminary you learn that, that help you to kind of unpack some difficult texts maybe a little bit better. We just have a couple of tenses in English. You have past tense, present tense, we don't really have a special form of 
future tense. We just add different words like I will do this, uh, and the verb stays the same. But in Hebrew, there's a dozen different tenses. One of them is this tense called hit pael. Say it with me, hit pael. Now we're Hebrew scholars. And it's used, for example, when King David is going down to Philistia, fleeing from Saul who wants to kill him, and we read, he played the fool. Do you remember when King David pretended like he was insane so that the Philistines would be amused by him instead of threatened by him and so that he'd be fed instead of killed? That's the phrase we find, that's the, the tense we find here. We should not play the part of a wise man or play the part of one who is wicked. We should not pursue, that's that idea of overly, it's that self-reflexive activity. We should not give ourselves over to these things as if I'm going to just be super, super wise and righteous and live. Or I'm going to be super, super wicked because I don't care, nothing bad is going to happen. Yeah, there's an act of the will that is engaged in thinking you have all these opportunities, life is uncertain, how are you going to live? And we run to these extremes that are ultimately self-destructive and self-deceiving. Jesus, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 23 declares woe well on the Pharisees and He connects these same ideas of righteousness and wisdom. Overly righteous and love to be called wise. Self-righteous. You know, when we look at our righteousness as the basis for how we can leverage God into giving us a good life or a long life or health or our wisdom, if we say, well, I am wise, therefore I am somehow entitled or have the opportunity to or deserve to have a good long life full of blessings, we'd miss the whole boat. And if we decide to go that route of the old Epicurean or the old uh, hedonist or the old uh, life is uncertain, eat dessert first. That whole kind of mentality that, well, I better just live it up as long as I can. You know, the whole eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I die. If you choose to define yourself that way and just lean into that, well, that's just a different kind of death. And we're told that the man of God, the woman of God, the child of God avoids both of these things and comes out with both. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to, to, to lay hold of both? He says here it is good you should take hold of this and from that withhold not your hand. You know, don't let go of the other. And I think that it is very important that we as Christians understand that on the one hand, we need to acknowledge that wisdom is preferable to foolishness. We see that in the verses I just talked about a moment ago. It's better than power. And we have to acknowledge that sin is a reality in our life. And we don't dare let it get dominion. We don't let it become a part of our identity. We fight against it. We mortify the sins of our flesh, as Romans 8 says. And so, central to this whole stream of thought that Solomon has is this idea that wisdom, truth, and wisdom and righteousness are very closely related in the Hebrew mind. It's more important than mere power. More, mere power to, to get all the good things you want out of life. And that we're all sinful. And he makes it very clear. He says there's not a righteous one on earth who does good and never sins. For those of you who've studied the Westminster Confession and Catechisms, you know the answer to the question, what is sin? Sin is any act of omission or commission. Two words that rhyme. An act of omission is something you omit to do. For example, you see someone you can help, you decide it's not worth your time. You didn't do the right thing. That is a sin of omission. Surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and does not sin. That's an act of commission. Not only am I not going to help somebody who needs my help, but I'm going to help myself to the candy on the counter at the grocery store. And there's a sense in which we both fail to do good things and constantly perpetrate harm upon others on a fairly regular basis. With big letters or small, depending on the day. And we must always be cognizant of the fact 
that we are on the one hand sinners. We must. Do not say you are not a sinner. James writes about that in his epistle to Christians in his day. Jesus calls us to repent. His whole sermon career summarized by he went about preaching repent for the kingdom of God is near. And it's not a popular topic. And it doesn't make for great devotional reading. But we have to lay to heart this fact. We are sinners. And we also have to lay to heart the fact that God's path is better. Wisdom, heeding the voice of God, pursuing righteousness is better. And too often we can do just one or the other. And we can say, I know I'm a sinner and fall into despair and not recognize the voice of wisdom calling us to a more righteous life. On the other hand, we can downplay our sin to the point that we utterly fail. B.B. Warfield, a 19th century uh, theologian at Princeton, an American, he wrote about this extensively, this tendency to pursue a, a, a practical doctrine of perfectionism that begins to see everything that we do as excusable or reasonable given the circumstances. And we have to be cautious of that. We have to be cautious of that. Because even if we don't acknowledge that we are sinners, Solomon very cleverly in his ancient way, perhaps uh, not as seamless as we would today, proves it. He proves it. He says, don't take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. How does that prove the fact that all men are sinners? Well, first of all, if you listen to everything that everybody says, says about you, you are going to hear some terrible things said about you. <laughs> unless you literally don't know anyone. <laughs> and secondly, your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. You see how Paul, uh, Paul <laughs> see how Solomon proves his point that we're all sinners? Every one of us has people that would say mean things about us. And every one of us has in our heart said mean things about others. Every one of us has conceived portraits of people that we're mad at that are very ungracious and sometimes profoundly unjust. And so Solomon brings right to heart this fact that in all the uncertainty of living and the lack of any guarantee for what's going to bring you happiness and longevity, we have to remember that we are sinners and that God's way is better. You have zero chance of living a healthy Christian life, of having any real, authentic experience of joy and contentment and peace if you neglect either one of these great truths. All this I have tested by wisdom. Verse 23. All this I have tested by wisdom, Solomon said. I will be wise, but it was far from me. So everything to this point is tested by wisdom. He's determined as much as he can that it's true. That was but, but it was far from me. It was not something I could lay hold of. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? So understanding how it all fits together, how to come up with a schedule or a calendar or a, a bullet point list or a tick list, as we like to say here at Church in the Canyon, for how to live our life, it's beyond him to organize it all in such a way that it can be sort of ironclad or foolproof. And this is what we get to at the end of the, the chapter. Solomon turns his heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things. The scheme of things. That's a composite organization. That's, the word shows up, I think, four times in these verses. Putting it all together. How do you put it all together and come up with your life plan? How do you put it all together and come up with your 10 lessons for life? How do you put it all together and package it into a best-selling book? 
And Solomon will confess that in his studying and searching to try to come up with this great scheme of things, there are four things he learns. Four things. One is that temptation is real and overwhelmingly powerful. Some of you who have read the book of Proverbs know that folly is described as a, uh, a prostitute, a harlot, standing on the corner, calling out, inviting people to come to their destruction. And I would remind you, if you think that's chauvinist, that also in Proverbs, wisdom is personified as a woman calling out. But wisdom gets ignored and folly gets pursued. And so here's this picture of foolishness personified uh, who's the very heart of folly is snares and nets. Their hands are fetters. And he who pleases God escapes foolishness. Escapes the destruction. Escapes the ruin. But everybody else doesn't. There's a sense in which temptation and the prevalence of satisfying your appetites of pursuing pleasure, living in the moment, is something that is irresistible to humans, whether you're men or women. And it takes the very pleasure of God to evade that trap. That's one thing he learns. Temptation is powerful. The next thing he learns is kind of a negative lesson. Behold, this is what I find, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. He's found that he is not capable of coming up with the perfect scheme of things. My father-in-law, Ken Williams, uh, spent his career as a counselor. He started as a guidance counselor in Paint Branch, which is a school, a high school in, uh, just north of, Baltimore, of D.C. And then he opened up a Christian counseling Organization. It became the second largest Christian counseling association in all of Maryland. And he has come to a conclusion that we are, as people, at our very core, we are code breakers. We are always, always trying to interpret the data around us and fit us into some kind of paradigm or scheme or pattern. And I want you to think about that for a moment because... That's one of many things I've learned from my father-in-law. I think he's right. We have a series of events or phenomena or experiences, and we innately want to try to organize those events and experiences in something intelligible that's actionable, that we can then live in light of. And one of the things that Solomon is saying here is that I couldn't do it. I could not come up with a scheme that accounts for all of the variables. It is too complicated. It is too complicated. And boy, the height of wisdom is in many respects the ability to say, this is beyond the scope of my intellectual powers. Think about how often we as people see a problem and we want to fix it. We see a problem and we want to fix it and sometimes our solution not only doesn't fix it, but introduces three new problems. We think about our desire to fix the environment, and sometimes all the environment needs is to be left alone. <laughs> but we go in and we introduce different species and think, oh, this is going to solve that imbalance, and before we know it, we've wiped out three indigenous species, and now we've got invasive stuff going on, and now we're trying to take care of that. Think about your spiritual life, how you have tried so hard to uh, organize and to control and to manipulate and to account for all the factors. and. It's all our own little sanctified versions of the Tower of Babel. And it sooner or later crashes, doesn't it? Solomon, the wisest who lived, after all of his studying, after what he calls his seeking repeatedly, acknowledges that I have not found the scheme of all things. Temptation is prevalent and powerful. Understanding everything in detail is beyond your ability. Something else. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. 
it is an impossibility to put your hope in anyone other than that one mysterious, messianic, yet to be born, one in a thousand. Don't put your hope or confidence in a man like me, in a person like you married, in your favorite kid, in your parents. You cannot put your hope in people. If you want to find someone upright, you have to look to that one. And lastly, the last thing he found, you cannot blame it on God. In the Babylonian Theodicy, which was written long before this, long before Ecclesiastes was written in its textual form, they say, See, the gods have not made man upright, but have filled their mouths with lies and deceit. And so it was the ancient pagan way to blame the state of humanity and our difficulty in relationship and our uncertainty in life on God who made us broken. He did it on purpose, just so He could lord it over us. The gods, the ancient pantheon, made us a mess so that they could be amused at our struggles. And God says something far differently in this word. See, this alone I found. And Solomon is here underscoring the fact that this is the most important of my four observations. Temptation is prevalent and powerful. We do not understand everything that happens. We can only put our trust in that one. But above all, know this, God made man upright. But we have sought out many schemes. God made us right. But we are the ones who have wandered away. We are the ones who, like sheep, have gone astray each to our own way. We are the ones who have pursued the way that seems right to a man, but in the, in the end it leads to death. We are the ones who have become altogether worthless, our mouths like open graves. God made us holy. How do we as Christians live in light of this? Repent and believe. Acknowledge the reality of sin in your life. Put your hope in that one who's fairer than 10,000, the Redeemer who's one in a thousand, that upright, righteous one. You might say, well, that's pressing the word thousand, isn't it? I mean, there have been billions of people alive, even today, let alone in the history of the world. And I would just remind you that the ancient Hebrew language didn't know of a number bigger than a thousand. They didn't have a vocabulary word for a million. This is a, a way of saying that He is one, the only one. There is only one. And that one is Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, the very Son of God who became flesh. And He alone resisted the voice of the woman folly. He alone knew the voice of the woman wisdom. He alone lived out a life of perfect righteousness. He alone died when He was young, yet was raised and lives forever. And He invites us to partake of all of His benefits and blessings. If we will acknowledge our sinfulness, come to Him for forgiveness, and have life. So I would invite you to do that. Dear Christian, reflect on the powerful truth we don't control anything. We really don't. But we can live by faith through anything. Amen? Amen. Amen? Almighty God, we pray that You would give us that wisdom that is the source of more strength than ten rulers. We pray that You would give us that deep and painful awareness that, Lord, as the prophet Amos said, our sins are great and many. And therefore, Lord, allow us to live in light of the fact that we know You are the God who made us good. And we have become sinful in Adam and Eve, such that each of us, as Psalm 51 says, was born sinful, born into it. It's our birthright. But Lord, You have given us the great antidote. You have provided that one in a thousand. You have given us a Savior that we can have life. And Lord, help us then to live humbly. Help us not to curse others in our heart. Lord, help us not to always think the worst of others, but to... Lord, help us find ways to think the best. 
Lord, help us to resist sin. Lord, Lord help, help us to seek truth. 